It's been over 100 days since Israel's brutal war on Gaza began. What is the situation in the besieged territory and the region? William Lai of the DPP has won Taiwan's presidential election. What lies ahead? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. It's been 100 days of brutal bombings and numerous human rights violations and genocidal acts by Israel in Gaza. Despite a global outpouring of anger against Israel, close to a million people hit the streets calling for a ceasefire this weekend. It has continued its offensive unabated, with the approval of the US and its allies. Children have been killed in the thousands, health workers and journalists targeted, and the people of Gaza have been left struggling even for food. The offensive has also had regional implications, with a face-off already taking place in the Red Sea. We go to Abdul to discuss this and more. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. A hundred days since the war on Gaza has begun, the brutality has continued unabated over these uh, past three months and ten days. Could you maybe first take us through what really is the situation right now in Gaza with the offensive and also the humanitarian crisis? Well, uh, the hundred days of Gaza war has basically created a massive destruction in the occupied Palestinian territory. And that we all know about. Uh, in the last 100 days, more than 25,000 Palestinians uh, have been killed. And in the last 24 hours itself, around 150 Palestinians uh, were killed in the Israeli bombardment. Apart from, there are reports coming at this moment that the Khan Yunis is specifically at the target of the Israeli army. Uh, they are not only uh, conducting ground offensive, but also bombing that enclave. And one should remember that this is uh, part of that territory where majority of the people who moved out from the northern Gaza because of the bombings and uh, ground offensive had uh, now taken shelter in and around it. It means this highly, uh, doubly, you can say the, this, uh, the area which saw the rise in population has also basically become the uh, uh, target of increased Israeli attacks. So uh, uh, that ground offensive continues, uh, bombings continue, more than 60,000 Palestinians are now wounded, humanitarian situation is bad, we all know that, we have repeated that several times on this, sh this show. The point is, uh, despite the claims that uh, uh, US, sorry, uh, the US has made that Israel is basically looking to minimize the civilian casualties in its operations inside Gaza, that basically has remained a false promise. In fact, the civilian casualty has not gone down uh, uh, in any substantial way. Uh, there are more displacements, more uh, at, at targeting of uh, civilian infrastructure and uh, as uh, in comparison to what was there before, uh, the UN uh, Security Council adopted a ceasefire uh, uh, in December. Uh, uh, since but, uh, there is also an important point to be remembered is that uh, the increased uh, in the last 100 days, uh, the Israeli offensive is basically has targeted as uh, uh, Gaza, uh, as South Africa has brought the case in the uh, uh, International Court of Justice, targeted deliberately the health system uh, in Gaza. And that basically, basically you can say, doubles the suffering of the common Palestinians who are wounded, who are trapped inside the debris created uh, due to the bombing, uh, Israeli bombings. And, and even if they are taken out, there is not enough uh, medical facilities available for them to be taken care of. And that basically prolongs the pain and suffering. Um, there are, of course, talks of uh, on and off. There are talks of uh, kind of uh, uh, some kind of uh, a truce, some kind of break while uh, in exchange of hostages. Uh, for example, Hamas uh, uh, issued a statement on uh, a Sunday evening uh, talking about uh, basically releasing a video of three hostages uh, saying that it is it is ready to release them in exchange of uh, uh, Israeli uh, uh, stopping uh, the bombings. But uh, Israel has refused, con constantly refused in the last 100 days of all such proposals uh, to stop or even halt the bombings. 
uh, um, uh, in exchange of the release of the hostages or on any other condition. And it seems that the primary goal remains to be, as they claim, to basically elimination of Hamas, which of course sounds very rhetoric because even after 100 days, Hamas has retained its capability to fight uh, and basically uh, inflict uh, severe uh, uh, loss, uh, losses uh, on the Israeli side. Right, Abdul. Now, moving on to the regional dimension, we know that, uh, you know, tensions have been spiking, especially in the Red Sea region, in the Southern Red Sea region, with the Houthis taking a very powerful position and the United States and uh, the UK responding with strikes uh, across uh, Yemen. So, what is the latest on that front? Well, uh, according to the latest statement issued by CENTCOM on Sunday, uh, US Central Command on Sunday, there was a, a, a kind of... A, anti-tank missile filed, sorry, fired from Yemen, which was intercepted uh, by an Israeli aircraft, sorry, an uh, US aircraft. Uh, this is the latest statement. Uh, and uh, if one should note that this is the first time since uh, the US and UK coordinated attack, uh, coordinated attacks inside Yemen on Friday and uh, uh, repeated or follow on attacks on Saturday targeting allegedly only the Houthi radar system or their capabilities to fire uh, missiles or drones and so on and so forth. Um, uh, this was on Sunday, Sunday's uh, missile was the first time since those attacks uh, where Houthis have responded. Uh, Houthis have claimed that they will not let the, the attacks on uh, its territory by UK and US um, uh, on Friday and Saturday go without any response, and one is waiting uh, when this uh, response will come, because uh, there is no immediate uh, uh, response as, as of now. So there is no room for complacency because Houthis retain uh, the capability of attacking any U.S. forces uh, in the Red Sea. And, and since they are operating quite near to Yemeni uh, border, y uh, Yemeni coastline, it is much easier for the Houthis to take aim at their ships. Uh, but uh, we do not know yet when and uh, how it, these uh, retaliation uh, responses will come. Um, apart from uh, what, who, see, the, the attack on the Houthis on Friday, of course, was a provocation made by the US and uh, its uh, uh, European allies uh, against the Houthis. So it was an, an attempt to basically save face in in the in, in the context when they have not been able to basically uh, pressurize Houthis to stop their attacks on the ships heading to heading to Israel, which they have declared as a policy in solidarity with the Palestinians in Gaza, uh, and and it seems uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, that provocation may lead to further escalation, and if uh, there is uh, really an attack on a uh, U.S. ship. Uh, which is successful, one uh, does not know where right. that will lead to. Thank you so much, Abdul, for that update. William Lai ching the Democratic Progressive Party, has been elected the president of Taiwan. He will succeed Tsai ing of the same party after his victory in a closely contested election. However, it won't be a bed of roses for Lai as his party has lost its majority in parliament. Now, it won't be wrong to say that Taiwan's relationship with China was one of the most important issues in this election and there definitely was some harsh rhetoric around it. But what happens after the dust settles? Will Thai pursue a confrontationalist attitude with China? We go to Anish for the details. Anish, thanks so much for joining us. Very crucial elections and watched across the world with bated breath almost because it signifies a lot. So, could you maybe first take us through what the results say because it's not only the presidential election that took place. Yes, so... Even if let's begin with the presidential election results because that is also quite important. Uh, we have to lie, uh, uh, Chingte uh, won the election, and uh, but he won with a very divided mandate. Now, uh, what we're looking at is about forty percent of the uh, votes that have been polled uh, to have gone to lie, and that is the only reason. It's pretty much the first past the post system when it comes to presidential elections in Taiwan. So you don't have to get the majority. And he would be the second such president to actually win without actually getting 50% uh, or more votes uh, in you know, Taiwan's history or electoral history at the very least. And uh, this is probably, uh, this clearly shows how uh, things have 
changed when it comes to how people uh, view uh, in, intra-China relations or cross-trades relations, uh, and primarily because Lai's only platform that existed was uh, his opposition to uh, to the mainland, to the government in Beijing, uh, his anti-communist uh, tirade that he used against his opposition contenders, and all of that did not really uh, give him the kind of leverage that he expected. He probably expected a redo of 2020 when uh, Tsai did the same thing and virtually she gained uh, an unprecedented number of votes, even though her party was expected to lose very badly. Um, and so this pretty much uh, is a situation right now. And we see the two opposition uh, candidates uh, Ho and Ko, both of them uh, being, uh, you know, combined together, they actually gained a lot of uh, uh, votes. Uh, but we are also seeing that people are kind of tired with the Kuomintang being the lead opposition as well. So you see the rise of uh, Ko Wen Jie and his uh, Taiwan People's Party uh, as a very significant third party in Taiwanese politics. And similarly, the same thing has happened in the legislative election as well. Uh, obviously, the, DB, the DPP lost its majority that it held for about eight years. That was the first time that it, in 2016 was the first time they actually held a majority in the parliament and it lost it uh, after Sai. So this is going to be a significant, uh, uh, you know, it clearly gives a message to the gov- to the new government that even though Lai won primarily because of the divided opposition, uh, the parliament, uh, which is now going to be dominated by opposition parties, uh, are going to have a sig- are going to be a significant roadblock to whatever uh, confrontational pol- policy that Lai would want to have when it comes to the mainland or for that matter, a very pro-U.S. Uh, policy that actually comes at the expense of uh, the interests of Taiwanese people as well. So a lot of things have happened, but what we are looking at is a very divided mandate, and it clearly shows that the old politics of, you know, whether or not you're pro-Chinese or anti-Chinese is, going, is not going to work as well. Uh, there is a significant level of disenchantment with the traditional kind of politics, and that is clearly shown in this current set of results. And Anish, I also wanted to quickly uh, go through what the responses globally have been from some of the key players to this election, uh, especially since, like you said, this is likely to be a continuation in terms of policy. Yes. So one of the things that is quite uh, evident is that there is now some level of softening, even though you you are already seeing congratulatory messages uh, from pro-West governments in the region and also from the West as well. Uh, and uh, but uh, interestingly, the most cautious tone was struck by Joe Biden, who said, who actually uh, made it clear that the U.S. does not support Taiwanese independence, uh, which was pretty much this kind of ambiguity has existed for a while now, at least under Trump, and it was continued under Joe Biden. It is now with the results that they're saying that uh, they cannot possibly support some kind of uh, a, a Taiwanese nation or a secessionist uh, tendency because the Taiwanese, the pro, so the so-called pro-independence parties have lost very badly. Uh, their coalition partners lost and DPP, which entertained that kind of tendency, also lost very badly uh, in terms of votes and seats. So definitely the Taiwanese people are clearly showing that they, do, they are not interested in a independent uh, Taiwan, they are probably looking at, uh, you know, a more peaceful plan where they can actually, at least, at the very least, peacefully coexist with the mainland, or maybe, you know, seek for reunification in, uh, if not the near future, but at, at least at the distant future. So this is the kind of message that has been given, and the U.S. is receiving that very well. And it's pretty much also how uh, China is uh, responding. It is also cautious, uh, but it is clearly stating that the results are not going to stop the eventual reunification, which is obviously the goal of, you know, the constitutional goal of what exists of the Republic of China in Taiwan, but also of the People's Republic of China. So uh, in all of these cases, what we're looking at is some mellowing of, uh, of rhetoric, at least from foreign players, but at the same time, there are, there are pro-U.S. Uh, governments in the region who are trying to provoke more tensions. But we'll have to wait and see how things go uh, until May, uh, when uh, when Lai is going to be 
uh, inaugurated as the president, uh, we might see a lot more back and forth now. Uh, there is going to be, uh, uh, you know, at the very least, uh, some attempt by the Sai government, the outgoing government, to release some kind of report about Chinese intervention, uh, whatever that be. Uh, but uh, in more, all of these cases, we are going to see more rhetoric. But we need to wait and see how far they are going to go. Because obviously domestic politics, uh, in the case of Taiwan, domestic politics and foreign relations are quite interconnected. And it is very difficult at times to segregate them when it comes to a lot of issues at the very least. So we'll have to wait and see how things go. But at the, at the moment, things are have mellowed down. If not, it's not going to provoke more tensions in the coming days at the very least. Anish, I think we can all hope for fewer tensions in that region, very important region, both economically and geopolitically. Thank you so much for those updates. That's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button.